All right. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or whatever time it might be for you. Um, so this is the first 2024 uh, Energy Justice Seminar Series. Um, we're so happy to have this happen. And um, before we get into it, let us start with a quick land acknowledgement. So we should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of Patwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Patwin tribes, the Kashildihi Band of Excuse me, the Kashaldihi Band of Winton Indians of the Kalusa Indian Community, Kletzaldihi Winton Nation, and the Yoshadihi Winton Nation. The Patwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. So, what is energy justice? Just a brief introduction before we get into our speaker for today. So energy justice refers to the goal of achieving equity in both the social and economic participation of the energy system, while also remediating social, economic, and health burdens on those disproportionately harmed by the energy system. Now, this definition by the Initiative for Energy Justice also explains that energy justice explicitly centers the concerns of communities at the front line of pollution and climate change, also known as frontline communities, working class people, indigenous communities, and those historically disenfranchised by racial and social inequity. Energy justice aims to make energy accessible, affordable, clean, and democratically managed for all communities. So some assumptions that we're working with today and throughout the sessions include the idea that the lack of diversity is due to systemic de deficits, that scientific norms and culture are often based in white supremacy, colonialism, and patriarchy, or rather those norms that are deemed harmful. Um, <clears throat> research culture is often intentionally exclusionary, and those histories of ex exclusion are not our fault necessarily. However, we have a responsibility to generate a culture of great greater inclusion. Now, uh, these assumptions were developed by Dr. Sarah McCullough, and they were used in her introduction to the Asking Different Questions seminar hosted by the UC Davis Feminist Research Institute. I encourage you all to look into it if you have a chance. And I'll pass things off to Afshan to talk about the vision for the seminar series. Yeah, so the primary vision of the series is definitely to grow the knowledge and the worldview, particularly for the students. Uh, who can identify the deeper and multifaceted just issues that are embedded in the study in, in the studied energy topics, but are not exclusively discussed. So, yeah, that's the main vision of the series. So, I guess you can discuss the like the overview of the whole seminar, how we are going to continue with that. Uh, thank you, Asha. Just going a bit over the logistics of the seminar we would be holding these seminars weekly on every thursdays on every thursday 10 30 to 11 30 and we've curated this seminar series in a way that we get to hear from a number of speakers from different uh different fields we have speakers from academia we have speakers coming in from research institutes and national labs we have people coming in from regulatory bodies the california and Edge commission for example and we also have the industry view on energy justice. For example, we have speaker coming in from SMUD. So we've tried to curate in such a way that we get to hear from all of these different fields and how they are incorporating and working to uh, involve energy justice in their respective domains. And the, the goal, which is, uh, I think my personal goal out of this seminar is to understand the concept of energy justice better and how these practitioners in their domains are understanding and applying the concepts of energy justice in their domains and how as a graduate student or as a researcher, I can then uh, apply these energy justice uh, concepts into my own research going forward. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. 
Lastly, just a recap of who we are. Uh, it's uh, Sagal, Afshan, and me, and we're running the student-led seminar series for this year. And uh, we hope that it'll be of great value to the egg community at UC Davis and to the people joining from beyond UC Davis as well. And please feel free to reach out to any of us with uh, questions, comments, and feedback on how to improve the seminar uh, for this series or even for the next year's uh, edition. And we're always looking for improvement opportunities in our work. And with that, I'll pass it back to Sagal, who will introduce our today's speaker, and then we can start our seminar. Thanks, Ovis. So I'll stop sharing and Tanya can get ready. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tanya Stasio. Dr. Tanya Stasio is a researcher at the Applied Economics Clinic, also known as AEC. She has more than five years of experience in research and analysis with a focus on decarbonization, climate risk, climate policy, and geographic information science analysis. She has authored reports on energy, climate, and environmental justice, and prior to joining AEC in 2021 as a researcher, Dr. Stasio worked for AEC as a research assistant for three years. So Dr. St Dr. Stasio has also completed internships with the Better City, the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, and Climate Action Business Association. Dr. Stasio holds a PhD in economics from Clark University, a Master's of Arts in Economics from Clark University, and a Bachelor of Science in Economics and Environmental Science from Simmons University. So with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Tanya, and uh, you have the floor. Great, thanks so much for that introduction, Sago, and thank you everybody for having me here. Um, today, I'm gonna talk to everybody about data-driven equity and environmental justice analysis, which is something that I work on very often in my position at Applied Economics Clinic. So just very briefly, the Applied Economics Clinic is a mission-based nonprofit consulting organization that offers expert services in the areas of energy, environment, and equity. Um, so our clients are primarily public interest organizations like nonprofits, government agencies, and green business associations. And our work products typically include expert testimony, analysis, modeling, policy briefs, reports, and much more, all related to the fields of energy and environment. So in today's presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to talk about four main things. Uh, one being an overview of environmental justice and equity in the energy space. Um, then I'm going to talk about several data-driven approaches that we have used in AEC work um, to address environmental justice and equity issues. And then I'm going to talk about several common resources and data sources that we use. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to walk through a few examples of how these approaches have been used in existing AAC um, reports. So the US EPA defines environmental justice as the fair, and fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of their race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Similarly, environmental equity focuses on acknowledging the unequal distribution, distribution of environmental harms. For example, adverse impacts from climate change and exposure to um, air pollution, um, et cetera. And the goal of identifying environmental equity concerns is so that we can address these disparate outcomes through more equitable climate, environment, and energy policy. Why does this matter? <clears throat> we know that environmental burden is not equally shared. The most vulnerable communities are the first and worst, uh, suffer the, sorry, suffer the first and worst impacts of climate change. And they also face increased exposure to air pollution and environmental hazards. For example, vulnerable communities are more likely to locate, be located closer to polluting facilities like gas and cold fire, coal fired fi power plants. Um, and are located, uh, and these polluting facilities are often located within or close to communities that have higher shares of Black, Indigenous, and persons of color populations um, or and low income communities. The reason that this matters so much is because increased air pollution has lots of adverse health impacts, including a number of respiratory illnesses that have been linked to increased exposure to air pollution. Um, there's also higher rates of infant mortality, um, heart attacks, um, not to mention the economic losses associated with lost work days, uh, which 
then can be translated into actual dollar um, costs that are faced from this disparate burden faced by these communities. Similarly, energy burden is not equally shared. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, um, energy burden for low-income households is 8.6%, which is three times higher than it is for non-low-income households, which is estimated at 3% where energy burden is the share of your income that you spend on energy costs. Um, so low income households who are already making lower incomes are, pay are spending a higher share of their income on energy costs compared to their wealthier count counterparts. Um, and <clears throat> the burden is not equally distributed depending on uh, the area that you're looking at, energy burden can be as high as 30% of a household's income. Why is this the case? Um, according to ACEEE, uh, low-income households often lack access to energy efficiency resources and programs. Um, they tend to live in more inefficient homes, uh, so they pay higher energy bills. Um, and um, what's it called? The low-income households of often uh, lack the upfront costs or access to capital that it takes to perform those heavy retrofits of your homes. Um, Lastly, um, low income households are also twice as likely compared to their higher income customers to be disconnected from electric service if they're unable to pay their bills. So there's lots of systemic injustice embedded within the energy field already. So now I'm gonna talk about um, several approaches that we use at AEC to sort of understand equity in a sp specific area and address equity within um, environment and energy policy. One thing uh, that a state uh, legislator or um, policy advocacy group might want us to look at is defining um, overburdened communities. For example, there are state level environmental justice community definitions that I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, for example, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey all have environmental justice community definitions. Um, which identify a particular census tract or census block group, which is just a small area within a um, city or town. Um, and they identify them based on a set of criteria. And these criteria typically have to do with uh, low income status, uh, living below the poverty line, um, BIPOC populations, um, and or limited speaking households. So if you see on this map here, this was taken from, a 2022 uh, AAC report titled the Boston Tree Equity Analysis. Here we mapped out um, the environmental justice criteria uh, for Massachusetts. So you'll see here um, the every single color that shows up on this map here is an environmental justice community. Those in gray are not environmental justice communities and this map is for Boston alone. Um, but if you look at the areas that are in the darker brown color, these are especially, oops, sorry, <laughs> these are especially overburdened communities because they meet all three of the environmental justice criteria in Massachusetts, which means that they are English isolated, low income, and have higher shares of minority populations compared to, um, the rest of the state, um, and the point of identifying these areas are so that state and policymakers, state and local policymakers are able to prioritize these communities when developing policy, create incentives to um, you know, lower the cost for them to participate in energy efficiency programs and things like that. Another example of a data-driven equity analysis approach is a co-location spatial analysis. Um, why would we want to do this? Um, we're trying to understand how socioeconomic stressors can overlap with access to clean air, public transportation, healthy food options, et cetera. Um, so for example, um, on the map here, uh, we show again, Boston from the Tree Equity Report um, and the overlap of EJ communities, major roads and fossil fuel plants. So communities that are located in close proximity to major roads, more likely to ex be exposed to high traffic congestion and therefore more pollution. Um, similarly, 
being located to next to a fossil fuel plant is going to put you at increased exposure to the pollution from that facility. Um, and what we do is we look at the overlap and we talk about how, you know, there's, there is overlap between these communities that are already facing disparate burdens and where these um, facilities are located and where the major roads are intersecting. Um, but there's lots of um, different analyses like this that you can do. For example, say you were trying to identify a food desert, you could show where the grocery stores are um, in relation to vulnerable communities and show um, if these communities are lacking access to grocery stores or, or EV charging stations or bike walking paths, what have you. Um, very simply, you could provide data visualizations of different um, equity measures. For example, uh, these two uh, images show the populations that were deemed to have low to no income according to um, the Massachusetts uh, environmental justice definition. And then um, those with, uh, and then the, the BIPOC map shows the share of BIPOC residents by census track in um, Boston. And so by looking at these visualizations, we can identify areas where there are higher shares of households that have lower incomes. And also by putting them side to side, you can see where those areas also line up with the areas that have higher shares of BIPOC folks. So all of these, you know, different approaches and exercises are, are like um, fact gathering missions, trying to understand the full picture of the existing disparities within an area and how they pertain to different energy um, access issues. For example, you know, uh, bus stops, EV charging stations, the presence of new fossil fuel infrastructure, uh, pipeline placement. A method that we use um, often at AEC is to create a composite index. Um, so we wanna understand the overlap in the distribution of burdens in face in a particular community. So say we want to look at more than just um, the share of BIPOC residents or the share of low income residents. We wanna see how all of these different measures overlap in the same space. Um, for example, um, in um, AC's 2020 social equity analysis of carbon-free Boston, as well as the Boston tree equity analysis that I've been showing you all maps from, we estimate a social vulnerability index, and that index is based on six measures of social burden, the share of households that speak limited English, the share of population that identifies as BIPOC, the share of the population that is disabled, the share of the population that earns 150% or less of the federal poverty level, and the share of the population that is a child and or the share of the population that is over um, the age of 65. So we use all of these measures to create one index of social vulnerability that shows us where these burdens overlap the most. This is the Boston Social Vulnerability Index from the 2022 Boston Tree Equity Analysis. As you can see, the, the higher the social vulnerability index, the darker the color, and those are areas where all six of those um, burdens overlap the most. And again, identifying these communities allows organizations and decision makers to target these places when they're trying to have more equitable policy impacts. Similarly, um, cumulative impact assessments, they look at the overlap and cross disparity effects of the impacts from um, a new event plus the existing disparities with the goal to identify neighborhood hotspots where these stressors overlap and vulnerabilities combine, putting a greater burden on the populations that live there. I will provide an example of this one later because I know that's a little broad. <laughs> um, so how do we do all of these things? What is the data that we use to accomplish all of these different uh, data analyses? Um, the first uh, resource I provide is a, a report from ACEEE, um, How High Are Household Energy Burdens? This is, report is a great source just for 
an overall understanding of uh, how energy burdens vary um, within the United States, um, across states, and across income. Um, the US EIA um, Energy Atlas provides power plant locations. So if you want to do a proximity analysis with power plant locations, that's where you would find them. Um, the US um, Census Bureau American Community Survey has lots and lots of information on demographic and financial characteristics of households and people. Um, this is also where we get um, all of the information for our social vulnerability index that I just discussed. Um, they also have monthly household electricity costs um, and home heating fuels, and they have this at pretty granular levels. Um, you can get, you know, national and U.S. averages, but you can also get uh, census block group or census tract level data. Um, and this allows for a lot more granular analysis um, and is often what you will need to identify um, an environmental justice community or something like that. Um, a more recent tool, the Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, CGIST, um, has lots of geographic data on burdens related to climate change, energy, health, housing, pollution, transportation, water and wastewater, and workforce development. The US Center for CDC ha um, places data set, um, has lots of information on health outcomes, health risk behaviors, disabilities, prevention, health status, and the social determinants of health. Um, the US LEAD tool um, has data on energy burden across the US and that is also available um, at the census tract level, um, as is the places data. Um, and then the US EPA uh, EJ screen tool has lots of EJ and supplemental ind indexes, um, environmental indicators and socioeconomic indicators that you can very easily overlay um, if you just want to explore a particular area. And then um, now I'm going to go into um, a few examples of AAC's past work where we use um, the different data approaches that I just discussed. Okay. The first study that I want to talk about is <clears throat> titled An Assessment of Backup Generators in Massachusetts and New York City. Um, so on behalf of Bloom Energy, we prepared two reports that assessed backup g diesel generators in Massachusetts and New York City. Um, where we compiled an inventory of all of these generators in each jurisdiction, um, and we reviewed the quantity, capacity, and proximity to EJ communities, um, as well as their emissions impact um, in both Massachusetts and New York City. And the reason that we did this is because in these places, uh, backup diesel generators are not actually included in um, environmental justice, sorry, not environmental justice, environmental regulations, so they don't have to limit their pollution. Um, because of how um, or how little they run because they're backup generators. Um, but uh, the study found that there's actually quite uh, a good amount of emissions coming from these generators. Um, and a lot of them are commonly cited near EJ communities, um, therefore exposing them to greater levels of air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions um, beyond what they're already exposed to. So if you look at um, this map here, this is a map of Massachusetts where the black dots are backup diesel generators um, and they have a transparency on them so that you can see that the darker areas are showing a high concentration of backup diesel generators. Um, and in the study, we found that um, the combined capacity of backup diesel generators in EJ communities is over half of the capacity in Massachusetts, meaning that over half of all of the capacity of backup generators is located in a vulnerable area compared to the rest of the state. Um, those are those are the disparate impacts that we're talking about. The same story was seen in New York City. Um, again, higher concentrations of backup diesel generators in EJ communities compared to non-EJ community areas. When we took a look at the numbers, um, we found um, just as we expected that larger percentages uh, that over, sorry, we found that over 80% and over 95% of um, generators are located within a mile of an EJ community. And then 
almost half in Massachusetts and almost 40%, sorry, <laughs> in New York City. Um, sorry, that should say New York City. Um, have generators um, within uh, EJ community borders. Second example, um, the impact of refinery row on the city of Corpus Christi. Um, so this is Nueces County on the right here. Um, Corpus Christi is this area here. It is a city in um, Texas. Um, we prepared this report on behalf of the indigenous peoples of the Coastal Bend, and this was a pro bono project. Um, this AAC report summarized the economic impact of the petroleum industry in Nueces County and the negative impacts of the polluting facilities located in what is called the Refinery Row District within Corpus Christi. Um, so if you see here on the map, there is a large cluster of fossil fuel infrastructure um, and petroleum refineries in particular in this area, um, putting these residents at um, much higher risk for the adverse health impacts of pollution exposure compared to those not living uh, within uh, as close by. Um, so just very broadly, 14% of Texas's petroleum capacity is located within Corpus Christi alone. And while the major petroleum companies promise economic benefits um, as you know, the main argument for you know why they're there and why they provide an overall benefit to the city of Corpus Christi, um, refineries actually employ less than 2% of the city's workforce. Um, and most of the folks that actually live there are working in um, healthcare and social assistance, um, food services, retail trade, what have you. Um, so essentially we found that the, this claim that the, the industry is making is, is false. And beyond that, not only are they not providing economic benefits, but the refinery row is causing all sorts of negative health benefits for these communities. Um, it releases high levels of harmful pollutants with minor consequences uh, for those that are working there, uh, while nearby neighborhoods uh, suffer high rates of asthma and cancer prevalence than other areas in Corpus Christi. So here we did two of those general data visualization maps um, showing that um, asthma prevalence is much higher in areas that are cl located closer to Refinery Row, um, similarly with cancer prevalence, compared to um, these areas where there's less fossil fuel infrastructure. So in this project, we created an um, overburden community index as well. Um, though it's called a different name, we use the same um, components that were used in the social vulnerability index for Boston that I discussed earlier. Um, and again, we found that the communities in Corpus Christi that had the highest overburden community index values, those most likely to host residents that are already overburdened by systemic inequities, um, are, are, are those that are located closest to Refinery Row. And then the last example that I am going to talk through is the cumulative impact assessment of the North Brooklyn Pipeline Project. Um, so in this report, AAC prepared a cumulative impact assessment on behalf of the SANE Energy Green Alliance and sorry, <laughs> SANE Energy and Alliance for a Green Economy in order to highlight the existing and overlapping socioeconomic, environmental, and health-related burdens facing the communities living near the pending Phase 5 pipeline construction and vaporizer additions at the Greenpoint Energy Center. So essentially, um, the company already has this North Brooklyn pipeline here in red. And they proposed in addition, this dotted line that would extend the pipeline through East Williamsburg in Brooklyn, New York City. Um, already in this neighborhood, there are lots of gas pipelines, petroleum pipelines, and existing fossil fuel plants. In addition to this extension, they also want to add a new um, vaporizer at the Green Point Energy Center. And I will note that it looks like it's outside of Brooklyn just because of the um, 
lack of granularity in the coordinates that we had, but the Greenpoint Energy Center is within um, Brooklyn. Now, um, the clients wanted us to assess the cumulative impact of the existing fossil fuel in, um, infrastructure in this area, as well as the impact um, at, of continuing and adding on to this existing pipeline. Um, so as I already discussed briefly, pr the proposed fossil fuel expansion projects are already located near an area that has a lot of existing fossil fuel infrastructure, um, but it's also adding threats to already overburdened communities in Brooklyn. Um, so these communities um, are not only exposed to all this fossil fuel stuff, but they also have uh, super fun sites um, in close proximity um, as well. And these are um, uh, environmental sites that are deemed um, hazardous and um, environmental justice areas are also located both um, where the proposed extension would be and um, surrounding the um, existing pipeline. Um, so adding on this existing fossil fuel infrastructure means that these communities would be at risk for even more um, adverse health impacts um, from gas service, which is what this new pipeline would be um, providing. Um, so you have the health impacts from methane gas leaks, from the air pollution, and you also have um, greenhouse gas emissions. So to create a cumulative impact index, it's a little bit more complicated um, than the um, individual composite indices like the social vulnerability index um, because it combines um, multiple indices into one. So for the Brooklyn project, uh, we had four different um, indices uh, that measured um, the disparate or the disparate exposure or their, the vulnerability of communities related to these four different categories. So housing, social, financial, and health. Uh, for housing, we use energy burden, um, living in older buildings, uh, uh, renter, whether or not there's a high share of renters um, and the vacancy rate of the houses there, uh, the social vulnerability index, uh, very similar to the one that we've used in the Boston report, um, but we also included um, education. So the share of residents that had an education level that was less than a high school diploma. Um, for the financial burden index, we considered um, receipt of income assistance, um, poverty, unemployment levels, and labor force non-participation. And then for the health outcome index, we looked at the prevalence of cancer, heart disease, asthma, poor mental health, diabetes, and poor physical health. And then the goal of the cumulative impact index is to combine the resulting indices from all four of these to understand how all of these um, measures are compounding and interacting with each other to create um, even greater, um, or sorry, I should say, um, like exasperating the current vulnerabilities in that area. Um, so what we found by creating the cumulative impact index in uh, Brooklyn is that the greatest impact of the the new project, the fossil fuel expansion project, would be helped by would be felt by the most vulnerable communities in the area. Um, and we found that out because um, the areas that had the darkest shades of um, the cumulative impact index have the greatest overlap in vulnerabilities across those four different categories. Um, and putting the pipeline or extending the pipeline in this area, um, in addition to the Greenpoint Energy Center, would put these communities at further risk for pollution and adverse health impacts. Um, and by knowing this, um, advocates are able to, to use this information to, to argue um, with decision makers sort of against um, putting you know, more fossil fuel infrastructure in these, this location. Okay, um, so I did go through that a lot faster than I intended and I am ready for questions. I know I talked about a lot of different things, um, but yeah, thanks guys. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Tanya. That was incredible. Um, so I sent this in the chat earlier, but um, if anyone has any questions at all, please uh, submit them through the Q&A feature. Um, and it seems like, okay, well, while people are coming up with questions, um, I was just curious. Um, well, I'm not personally curious because I feel like I know this from living in the Boston area, but for people uh, not familiar with Boston's geography, mm -hmm. um, could you explain what the large areas of light yellow were on the Boston social vulnerability map? I know it was kind of a lot of slides back. Uh, oh, it's okay. <laughs> Let me just get um, there. Right, there we go. Yes, so these are the areas that have the lowest social vulnerability. So we tried to make sure that any areas that were invalid like for example this is a park um you know green spaces and such that we removed them from consideration so they wouldn't look like areas that had low vulnerability um so these communities should correspond to those that have the least overlap in social vulnerabilities um so it could be a community that has a very high bipoc share but very low shares of children, disabled people, uh, older adults, those living in poverty, et cetera. Or it could be an area that, you know, they're all, like all the demographics look good. Um, but there is, I just wanted to caveat that, that like, you know, it could be that only one criteria or one of the measures is high versus another. And that's why a community has a lower social vulnerability index. This is about the overlap of vulnerabilities. Mm, great, thank you. I I realized I said light yellow, but I actually meant gray. So oh oh okay yeah. <laughs> these are areas that are are not necessarily where people live. <laughs> um, okay. So um the airport is over here um and I think this is the common, mm -hmm. the Boston common, and then um this I think is Franklin Park. Um it might be the arboretum, but it might be the arboretum. Yeah, I always mix up those. <laughs> awesome. Um. Oh, so we have a question. Um, oh, we have a couple questions actually about the diesel generator project. Um, so somebody says um, proximity doesn't necessarily mean usage. Did you analyze how much the generators were also being used? Would you have come to the same conclusion if they had a higher prevalence but were barely being used? Okay, so I agree proximity doesn't necessarily mean usage. And um, while that's the only component that I discussed um, for this, just because it is um, one of the approaches we have to addressing equity in the energy space, we did do um, an emissions analysis on these uh, generators to assess how much um, emissions they're actually emitting. Um, and that did take into account how often they're being used. Um, and that was how we determined that the exposure was, you know, significant enough to be an issue. Um, the proximity was really just um, putting it in context of they're emitting a lot and they're located close to EJ communities. Um, without the, the one or the other, the story wouldn't necessarily be there. Um, but that's a great question. Um, and then Sagal, you can read the second one. <laughs> You're muted. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> um, the next question about that is, do we know why there's a correlation between EJ community borders and location of diesel generators? So for example, uh, what if the EJ communities need diesel backup generators because the power goes out more frequently or it's cheaper to operate than electricity? Good question. Um, so it's not a very direct answer, but we do know that there are several, you know, research papers, um, out there that show that, um, historical, historic redlining practices and what have you have a lot to do with this. Um, so the drawing of, you know, community borders, um, has a lot to do with why and how certain neighborhoods are, um, you know, wealthier than others, have better infrastructure than others, um, have um, lower housing values than others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we don't know exactly that it's because um, 
you know, they're putting these um, facilities in these areas specifically because they want to expose these folks to, you know, bad air quality. But we do know that there is a like an established um, history of, you know, communities of lower incomes and communities with higher shares of BIPOC folks um, having to to face more environmental hazards than than others. It's it's not typically a, a, a generator comes after um, the community type thing that generators usually place there um, because there aren't sort of enough or there isn't enough community um, bargaining power to stop it. <laughs> um, but that's a very, you know, general response. Um, I would have to, you know, do more research to provide um, the specific details there, but it's not an easy question to answer in, but I, I'm pretty confident that it's not just because they need them. <laughs> Got it. So the final question from this group, uh, what conclusions, if any, were you able to draw from the fact that there's a correlation between diesel backup generator location and EJ community? Um, so I think the conclusion is, uh, you know, what we discussed here, which is that um, these communities that have already been shown in, in past research to be exposed to higher levels of um, air pollution and environmental hazards um, that, you know, that we need to prioritize reducing um, the exposure of these communities to these pollutants um, and need to make sure that when we're making advances in the clean energy space that these communities are prioritized first because that's how we achieve you know a more equitable energy future um, by trying to address you know the systemic inequities that have already you know shown themselves in the energy field um, historically so without providing these baseline analyses of like this is what it looks like this is what the situation is in this area, um, you know, decisions makers sort of like don't have anywhere to start. Um, and that's pretty much where we are with, with a lot of states. Right. Um, we got another question here. So this participant says, uh, my familiarity with backup generation are in the use for critical facilities such as medical office buildings. Um, what were those generation? What were those generators used for? Um, so that's correct. Backup G diesel generators are are commonly used at um, emergency services uh, service locations. Um, so at hospitals, um, fire stations, um, schools, um, things like that. Um, and yeah, so the answer is that that is the answer. <laughs> um. So another question, I assume this is also about the um, diesel analysis. Have you identified data limitation for analysis? Yes. So in all, in all of our reports, um, we provide um, explanations for where all of our data come from and, and how we modified it. And we also identify where it's lacking. And, you know, sometimes we identify, you know, what would be best in an ideal world. Um, but a lot of the times uh, data availability and data quality are a huge issue in the field, um, but we do what we can and we're as transparent as possible about what we do do. Um, and we encourage people to, to take a look at the data out there um, and encourage um, folks to, to take, sorry, to use data more um, to understand energy and equity topics. So um, another question, this goes back to the Climate Vulnerability Index. How do you normalize and combine different, vulnerabil different vulnerability data points? Um, so I'm happy to follow up with any specific methodology questions via email, but very briefly, I'll address that with, um, we typically weight them. Um, so we take all of our measures and uh, for each measure we create, um, I'm assuming you're talking about the component indices, um, but in, 
sorry. Sago, can you repeat the question again? I just want to make sure I'm answering it correctly. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Um, the question is just, how do you normalize and combine different vulnerability data points? Yeah. Okay, so typically for the composite indices, which I think is what they're talking about, um, we calculate the share of the population or the share of households that meet certain criteria and or... Um, Sorry, it'll be easier if I just show the the table. Um, so we calculate averages and shares according to each index. So um, for example, this one, it would be the share of the population within a certain census tract that identifies as black, indigenous, or a person of color. Um, and then we have all of these shares for all the census tracts and we use, we weight them based on the, um, the maximum of the range, the minimum of the range. It's a whole calculation. Um, and uh, we then combine those um, into an index that scores them from zero to one. Um, but that is my very general answer answer, but I can give you a more detailed answer if you follow up with me via email. Um, and also I can um, send you all links to the reports that I discussed here, which will have a lot more information on the methodologies than I covered during the, the presentation. I wanted to get a lot in here, which meant that I glazed over a lot. <laughs> yeah, any follow-ups would be fantastic. I'm sure people are interested to hear more. Um, so we have another question. Um, here. So this person says, these studies are drawing very important conclusions that may have not been available to stakeholders in the past. Are you finding the results are being received positively and impacting policy and decision makers actions moving forward? Um, in my experience, it's been a mixed bag. Um, sometimes, you know, um, Advocacy, advocacy groups or, or what have you um, will use our work to try to, you know, prevent the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure or, um, you know, something like that. And, and it doesn't work, you know, um, and, and the, the new infrastructure is still built. Um, but other times, um, public um, support and research, um, especially data-driven research, um, is received really well by uh, governments in um I think it's important uh, that work like this is provided in a way that, you know, anyone can read it. So general audiences as well. And I think just spreading awareness by producing work like this is, is a success as well. Um, but I would say that it, it's, it's received well on uh, most of the time because we are very um, fact driven, data driven. We're not, um, and we don't have, you know, a political affiliation in any way. Um, all of our work is, is very auditable. Um, and yeah, so I would say in general, it's, it's pretty successful and received well, but sometimes, you know, things get built anyway. Thank you. Um, so we have a follow-up, um, from the question about what those, what the diesel generators were used for in terms of like critical facilities. So um, they ask, is there a relationship to disadvantaged communities? I assume that's, is there a relationship between what the generators were used for and disadvantaged communities? Um, I don't think that we, we went that far into it. I think we were just looking at, um, and I'd have to look back at the report, but I believe we were only looking at how often they were being run what the associated emissions would be for that um, operating time and um, the proximity of these diesel generators to existing environmental justice communities in that area, or sorry, across uh, New York City or across Massachusetts. Um, but we didn't necessarily look at the reasons why they were running, um, but they are emergency backup generators, which means they would kick on during any um, grid service outage. Um, so during emergencies, um, and I know there are reports out there that discuss, um, the prevalence of outages in vulnerable communities. Um, but we did not, uh, look at that in this report. So I cannot say definitively whether or not there's a relationship.
Um, yeah, I just want to remind folks that the Q&A is still open. So if you have any questions, please throw them in there. Um, give it a second. I guess in the meantime, I have a more general question. Um, so in your experience doing equity analysis, um, have you noticed any large barriers in terms of data access? Is it typically hard to find the data that you're looking for? Is it, I noticed you shared a lot of resources that are available in terms of sharing, uh, in terms of uh, publicly available data. So I was just wondering if there are metrics that you wish you could have maybe that would help immensely, um, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think if we just had more information about energy at like uh, the household level, um, that would be really great. Uh, because I right now we have, you know, the US DOE lead tool, which provides, um, I can actually, since we have time, I'm gonna show you guys what it looks like, um, which has energy burden. Um, based on it's it's based on American community survey data um but if we could have you know more information that was available on um you know energy efficiency participation um energy bills um you know participation in in utility retrofit programs, things like that. If we could have more information about um, how different types of customers, so low-income customers, residential customers are participating in different energy programs, it would allow us to identify, you know, where the gaps are, you know, where um, trying to provide incentives to folks that, you know, can't necessarily, you know, retrofit their whole home is not working um, because, you know, you'll see these small studies that happen, um, you know, for a particular town or even a state, but there's no, you know, U.S. tool or or data source that that allows you to look at sort of um, how costs vary across different incomes um, and how program participation varies across uh, different incomes, as well as, you know, household demographics. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, we're always going to want more data and um, like the the U.S. places health data set like that one is, um, you know, one of the only health data sets that are easily accessible out there. And um, it's just a measure of prevalence. So it's not necessarily the most perfect data source. Um, so there's there's a lot to be done, I think. Um, and there's a lot of data that is only available um at certain levels, like higher up, um, I'm rambling now, but yes, I, I, there's lots of data, particularly energy data that I wish was more available, but, um, let me show you what the lead tool looks like. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yes. Um, so this is the USDOE lead tool. Um, and right now it's just showing a map of the U S and, um, let's see if I can expand this course it's going to be different than it was earlier <laughs> um i'm pretty sure it's showing energy burden right now but it's unclear <laughs> but you can filter it and look at um energy burden across different incomes um building ages heating fuel types um building types renter or home ownership um, and you can also access the um, underlying data um, either by downloading the data or um, by going to, I don't know how to get to it from here, but there's um, a, a whole data page that allows you to identify and download the data by state. Um, and this is a, a pretty useful tool because um, estimating energy burden can be a challenge, um, especially since in the um, American Community Survey data, they have, you know, monthly energy costs, um, but, um, sorry, they have monthly electricity costs, but they don't have, um, monthly energy costs. 
Um, so you can only get electricity burden. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. So a follow-up uh, related to the energy burden data. So I was wondering uh, what kind of, for the Massachusetts map uh, in your presentation, did you did you use that data set for identifying energy burden in Massachusetts? Or I was just wondering what the underlying data was for that. Yes. So for, so for the Boston tree equity analysis or for the, uh, the Massachusetts environmental justice communities? I think it was the tree analysis. Okay. Uh, well, for, for both of them, <laughs> uh, we use um, American Community Survey data, um, and we used that data to um, designate each census tract as um, an EJ community or not, um, based on the EJ community definition in Massachusetts. Um, and since we have time, I can also show you that. And one other thing is, um, if you also considered uh, air quality in the residential buildings while considering the other data points, I don't remember if air quality was mentioned there. Uh, no, so air quality is really tough um, because we don't have granular air quality data. Um, if you look at a distribution of where the air quality monitors are in your state, for example, um, you'd be surprised to see that there aren't as many as you think. Um, and there aren't as many data points being collected as you would like. Um, and what pollution data that is collected by each monitor varies. Um, so the data is, that that's actually a great example of where I wish the data was better. Um, uh, air pollution data is, is not great. And a lot of times they use uh, models um, to sort of like uh, interpolate the missing um, areas. Um, and it's not clear unless you dive into the data that that's what's happening. Um, so it might look like it's granular, but then if you actually look at the site locations of the air pollution monitors, it is not. So no, we did not use air pollution uh, data in in the analyses um, because it wouldn't vary very much at the census tract level, the exposure uh, comp using that data, which is why we like to look at the proximity to fossil fuel infrastructure sort of as a proxy for that. Got it. That makes sense. Yes, okay. and then um, lastly, I'm just going to show you guys an example of what the EJ designation looks like in a workbook for um, Massachusetts, because because we have it. <laughs> okay, so you'll see here we have every block group um, in Massachusetts, and these are just the GOID tags that come out when you download data from the American Community Survey. Um, and this is the name that's assigned to each of those geotags. Um, so what we do, um, again, in the name of transparency, is we pull our data into library tabs, and we include the sources um, within those library tabs, and we try not to touch the data at all. And anytime we do, we mark it in gray as a calculation. Um, we then use, uh, we then create analysis tabs that pull from these data library tabs so that anybody who wanted to could follow sort of what we were doing. Um, so in order to make the EJ designation in Massachusetts in purple here, um, we made sure to pull the, the total population for each block group, as well as the median household income, the share of um, households that are limited English um, and the share of households that identify as BIPOC. Um, and then um, based on these shares, we then um, designate whether or not they meet each of the EJ criteria for Massachusetts. And um, you'll see all the ones that are highlighted are the ones that do meet the criteria. And then the environmental de justice designation is just whether or not any of these criteria are met um, that's an environmental justice community. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Tanya. Um, so with that, if there are no more burning questions, I think we can wrap things up. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Stasio, for having, um, for doing the first presentation of the quarter. It's so much appreciated. And, um, to everyone who's joined, thank you for joining. And, uh, we hope to see you at our next session.